Everybody, this is Guest Cleese Stamus and the E2KG Entertainment Crew back once again with another episode of Correction X, our second episode in our short format series covering short format series television shows. And here with me tonight, as always, is Mr. Dave Petchy. How you doing, Dave? Good, good. Good. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Fox Network's show, The Gifted. Uh, tonight we'll specifically be talking uh, episode number four. Um, Season one, episode four, uh, entitled Exit Strategy. So, interesting episode. Uh, definitely a slightly different feel, I felt, than the first three. A little more talking, a little more uh, dialogue focused, a little more character development focused. Right on the teetering edge of uh, risking being a Talking Heads episode. Um, but, they, but they walk that line pretty tightly and kind of pull it back. Um, particularly with the final uh, kind of action sequence. So right. Dave, was, there was kind yeah, of like ahead. a lot of suspense building up to the action in a sense. Right, right, right. So why don't you kind of go ahead and give everybody your general impressions while I get the social media out, and then we will start talking about our scene-by-scene rundown highlighting uh, the particular scenes that we felt stood out this episode. All right. Um, so this episode was called Exit Strategy. If you didn't already catch it, all of the episodes – have an X in them for their titles. Um, and so this episode, um, I really liked the fact that we got to meet a new mute, a new mute called Pulse. Uh, I'll go a little bit more into detail about what I think about that later on in the episode. Um, overall, <clears throat> I thought it was really good. Um, the backstories to some of the other characters and the, the relationship development uh, among characters, which um, I saw at Gisigli's notes, because we have notes tonight, um, that we're going to talk about, um, you know, kind of the development between characters and uh, things that we might start seeing coming up uh, for the game. Um, the end of the episode, um, you know, leaves us off as there's a big war coming and in the trailer, you know, there's a mention that the X-Men, um, there's a reference thrown that they want to stay out of this war that's going on right now. Um, so I wonder if that we're going to be seeing, um, an appearance by somebody soon. Um, and I just, I think it was, a, you know, it's another great episode. It's hard to go back and watch a CW uh, TV show after watching The Gifted. It's kind of like, oh, man, like, CW, you just, you're hurting me so bad. Um, so that's kind of my general impression. Hopefully, I guess Lise is ready to chime back in. Otherwise, I'll try to keep stalling. Um my favorite character I think so far is going to have to be Thunderbird. Uh, I really like him as the leader. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think he's got a lot more connections that we don't know about. Um, and the opening scene with him um, and Pulse was really good. And I'll get into how I feel about that. Um, once we start rolling. Um, yeah, I guess Liz, who would you say is your favorite character thus far? My sister, I know, really enjoys Lorna Jane or Lorna Dane. Uh, still Stalin. No, uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. So, um, <laughs> no, I'm I'm right there with you. I I, I like Thunderbird. Uh, it's and you bring up a couple of interesting points. If we if we sidestep just a skosh off script, um, you talk about uh, I think you mentioned you know you. 
you really like Thunderbird as the leader. But w- one of the things that I'm starting to question is I, I feel like we're being set up to see Caitlin, uh, played by actress Amy Acker. Um, Caitlin. Caitlin oh, Strucker, okay, the mom. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and every, and, you know, for anybody who's kept up with any of my stuff and has watched this show, um, people should know or, or do already know that I'm a Whedon disciple. So uh, he's just one of my favorite curators, and I'm just very familiar with a lot of his work. So, of course, I was originally exposed to A.B. Acker um, as the character uh, Fred, uh, Winifred uh, Burkle on uh, Angel. Uh, and eventually also became the hybrid character, I guess, Illyria, um, in later seasons of that show. And then I guess she also played uh, on The Dollhouse, which, um, again, I'm a big Whedon fan, but that's that's not a series that I ever particularly uh, caught up on. So, um, so I just feel like each week we see her more and more stepping up to a leadership role and kind of strongly influencing the, 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 the mutant resistance in which direction they should go. Um, and she's kind of a matriarch, matriarchal figure, I think. I, I, I feel like she's kind of becoming everybody's mom. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, pr- pretty interesting. Um, well, let's go ahead and start with uh, the, uh, the, the, the scene-based, time-based uh, rundown. So the first scene that I have uh, in our rundown takes place uh, about 16 and a half minutes or so into this episode. Um, so the general setup of this show, of this episode is, um, everybody is kind of gearing up to go do a prison break to get Reed and uh, and Lorna out. Um, Lorna, aka Polaris, um, and and they originally start formulating uh, a, a massive uh, offensive strike on the facility once they kind of narrow in on exactly where they're being held, uh, based off some information that they've gathered. Um, they they come to find out that they're going to be moved to uh, to a, a new detention center, um, relocation facility, I guess, and uh, and and they and Caitlin comes up with the idea of why don't they nab them in transit? Uh, so they're starting to formulate this plan in about sixteen and a half or minutes or so into the show. So there's a few things that go on um, as kind of a part of a large, very elaborate kind of setup for what's going to happen, but. Uh, this far into the episode, we get this instance of the, the twins uh, learning to use their powers in tandem. Now, I know that they're not twins. Um, uh, Lauren Strucker is uh, at least a year older than right, Andy, yeah. maybe two, I think. Um, however, they still feel like Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver to me, so I'm still going to call them the twins. Um, they feel a little like North Star and Aurora. Uh, for for fans of Alpha Flight, so I'm still calling them the twins, just for simplification. Uh, and 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 what happens in this scene is we see Lauren come up with the concept that hey, if um, and you you also get kind of a little bit of a I think did you I think you mentioned kind of a havoc and Cyclops feel between the two of them. Um, and this yeah scene, yeah exactly yeah and this scene kind of highlights that because you have um, Cyclops who at first at least. I mean, you know, without his visor, just sends out a wide area kind of blast. Um, but then, but then, Havoc has always been the one who's been able to focus his power. So, um, in this scene, what you have is you have Lauren come up with the concept that if Andy can um, send out uh, these big uh, wave blasts or whatever, um, then then she can use her. I don't know what they are. It's kind of kind of like the Invisible Woman's kind of uh, like sh- like shaped shielding <laughs> that she's able to put together. But um, but basically, what she does is she she a little Green Lanternish in some cases. Um, she basically constructs. <laughs> she basically could, throws off. So so Andy is sending out waves and waves and waves of this. I'm going to call it seismic energy, whatever it is. And she basically sticks a funnel out in front of his wave, and that takes um, his his kind of area energy projection and cordones it and focuses it um, into a little bit more, not quite a ray beam, um, but definitely kind of a kinetic, you know, a, a slightly more focused kinetic uh, projection. So um, so I thought that that was pretty interesting uh, and, and, and bodes well into the show, right? It, 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 for me, it kind of calls up the images uh, of the X-Men comics of all of the what I call the special maneuvers, right? So kind of the fastball special yeah. between Colossus and Wolverine uh, and some of the other things. I don't know. What did, what did you think about that whole scene, Dave? 
Yeah, no, I thought it was good. Um, you, you, yeah, it was definitely an ode to the classic, you know, combining two mutants' powers, you know. Um, we saw, in the, you know, X-Men Apocalypse, how kind of um, Gene would guide um, Cyclops' beams at time. Um, and definitely, yeah, definitely I enjoyed that. So now you were mentioning something that you liked about the character Pulse, which we saw introduced in this yeah. episode. Yeah, um, so that's actually re rewinding it back to the beginning of the episode. Um, it, it re that scene really reminded me of the 90s cartoon with Morph. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but I feel like that must have been an episode that was played over and over again, so it's stuck in my head. Um, more, they're escaping... Um, from I believe it's a detention facility and Wolverine um, has to leave Morph behind and he's captured by the Sentinels and he's imprisoned. Um, and then later Morph is kind of turned on them. And I don't know if that was meant to be kind of like a direct reference, but that's, I thought of that when I originally saw that scene. Um, I really liked Pulse. Um, as a character, you know, somebody that could shut down all the mutants' powers because that's uh, been a trope. Like many, uh, we've seen different X Men have that ability in the past. Um, and this time it was a bit different because he was kind of zombified. And uh, well, I should, I'll, I'll get into that scene later on, but um, it's just, it was kind of cool. And I'm wondering if that they're going to, we're going to be able to see Pulse again and kind of rescued. Um, and so I'm really hoping we can see what's going on in that detention facility because um, there's a different variations of it, you know, um, through the through the cartoons. Um, gosh, the last one that was Wolverine and the X-Men had a really interesting one where they were capturing X-Men. And then, of course, in the 90s cartoon. Um, so, yeah. All right, yeah, cool. So... Um, so next scene that I want to talk about takes place at about 18 minutes into the episode. Uh, so, so this scene, which is kind of our first, in my mind, like really powerful acting scene, um, we have we have Reed uh, tell Polaris that his kids are mutants. Now, since Polaris showed up uh, in the same detention facility with Reed, he has been trying to convince her to take make an effort to escape. Um, so he gives her kind of this long dramatic, heartfelt story about how now he gets it now that his kids are mutants. And and it's interesting because um, he's, he's quickly taken off guard when Polaris's response is, is not what he was expecting. He was expecting her to empathize with him and to um, immediately extend some feelings of loyalty, and that is not the case. Um, she uh, profoundly tells him that he's not going to get empathy from mutant kind just because now, all of a sudden, now that it's his family in danger, um, uh, you know, he's going to flip, right? Uh, it, so, um, you know, she kind of sets the tone, I felt, in the scene that we're going to get a bit of a redemption story in this of Reed trying to work his way back. Um, and, and he's going to have to overcome uh, all of the hate and animosity that he's generated by being a member of the prosecution, the, the, the lawyer, the legal team for Sentinel services or for the mutant task force. Um, uh, it, it, I worry a little bit in this age of television um, uh, in the wake of Game of Thrones, because now I think between, you know, Joss Whedon having done it so many years on his shows and now extending that into the movies that he's done, right? Because we, we see characters die um, in, in, in Avengers, at least Age of Ultron. Um, and, and now Whedon is over in the DC universe. Um, and, and with Game of Thrones just like heartily dispensing with main characters, you know, every season, um, I worry a bit that uh, Hollywood is about to become very frivolous with the elimination of characters. And so I, I, I worry that Stephen Moyer, uh, Reed Strucker, uh, with the story of redemption and, and I, I I worry that he's going to be scripted to just go, you know, I'm never going to be able to gain the mutants' loyalty um, unless I sacrifice myself. Uh, and, and I think he's kind of being set up for that type of a demise. Um, 
but it's definitely one of the strongest character scenes uh, so far I, in the I series. Uh, yeah, yeah, I kind of feel like it's going to be one or both parents are going to be in kind of a sacrificial um, spot down the road. But yeah, we'll have to see how, how it goes down. I hope not. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of think with all the time Reed has been separated and all the time that the camera has spent on Amy Acker, um, I just kind of think that's what's going to wind up happening. Because okay. uh, I don't think it'll impact the show that much because they've set this tone of like Amy kind of being the one that you need to keep your eyes on. Um, okay. So yeah, and I, and I thought... Uh, uh, is it is uh, the actress's name who plays uh, Lorna? Is that is it Emma? Emma Dumont, right? Dumont? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's her name. Uh, we'll, we'll fact check that while we're going along here. Um, but yeah, I thought it was an incredibly powerful scene uh, from her. Just she just kind of does this rolling thunder thing where she like it 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 already starts off very brittle, but then it just kind of builds and builds and builds and crescendos, you know. And uh, and I thought that was really a really effective uh, delivery. Yeah, it's just like you know. Tell me when you have to, uh, you know, buckle a kid in so that he <laughs> doesn't separate from his mom and she has to go to prison, you know? Right. Like, how intense that scene was. Yeah, that was pretty deep. Right. Now, you wanted to talk about a little... So, so, hold on tight, folks. I should have mentioned... Uh, so, number one, uh, we, we always screw this up. I'll put it in the right... Uh, this is definitely a spoiler show. We are going to talk about the episode. This is a fan cast. We're assuming that you have watched the episode and are coming here to participate in the discussion. Um uh, you know, following up after having seen the events unfold. Um, and if you are, hold on very tightly because we've got about probably about 30 more minutes or so and a lot happens in this episode. So yeah. you know, I, I in my, in my uh, talking points, actually skipped the whole uh, set piece of uh, Marcus Diaz going back uh, to enlist the cartel for aid. But, but Dave, you got it in yours, so, so go ahead. Yeah, and, uh, okay. Um, so Eclipse goes to the cartel. I thought was a very cool scene. Um, you know that we didn't know about that in his backstory until this episode. Um, and I don't ever remember the cartel ever being present in the X Men universe. So that I thought was a very nice twist. And even more of a twist, his ex girlfriend is now the cartel leader. Um, so, th so that was just very interesting. Um, and to find out how they got that information is like another interesting, do they have like, um, you know, are they getting, are they getting their information from other mutant spies? Like, does the cartel actively try to recruit mutants? Um, just things that, that pop up to my head. Um, the risk that I feel like the cartel could also easily betray the mutants and do a lot of damage. Um, but either way, we learn that Eclipse goes back to, you know, doing some dirty deeds for this cartel leader. Um, so uh, we know that it's not going to be good. Um, and the fact that, you know, it'll be interesting because he's going to have to tell Lorna, hey, if I didn't already tell you this, by the way, I saw my <laughs> ex-cartel girlfriend just to get you out. Yeah, and it's going to be an interesting dynamic. There's no love lost uh, between, uh, I think her name is C Camilla or Carmella. I'm yeah. not sure which. Um, there's no love lost. Uh, you know, uh, Eclipse left her for uh, Polaris. Um, so, so there's some jealousy and animosity there. Um, and I'm sure that Polaris, uh, given that she and Eclipse have a child on the way, will not want Eclipse having anything to do with the cartel. So, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, it'll be interesting to see if uh, Carmela and Polaris uh, come to blows in a straight up fight. Um, yeah, I do. I am kind of interested in seeing Polaris get back at uh, at the uh, at the faction leader who kind of um, took her down in jail and kicked her in the stomach uh, when she was pregnant. I would kind of like to see her get her come up, and so um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Um, it'd be interesting to see if the cartel becomes a third faction, right? If if the mutants wind up uh, kind of either getting caught in the crossfire between the cartel um, and Sentinel services, potentially, um, or if the cartel is just going to kind of be this shadowy organization that periodically comes up, we will have to wait and see. So on to the next scene, uh, about 20 minutes into the show. Um, and, and I have a hard time 
I have I still haven't wrestled the ground whether or not this is the best scene from the episode and and also the best um, character scene of the season or the one that we just talked about um, that we were talking about before uh, with the debate between Polaris and Reed. But um, uh, but in this scene, Lauren confronts her mother again, played by Amy Acker. Um, when the latter insists that Lauren and Andy can't participate in the convoy takedown. So in this first in the in the very first thing we talked about at the top of this show. Uh, Lauren and Andy were learning to use their powers to, in tandem. In this scene, they have just uh, demonstrated for Thunderbird and Caitlin um, the results of their of their very short order training. Um, and while Thunderbird is getting excited about having the notion of having a new tactical uh, capability in his arsenal, um, uh, Caitlin says, "No, you know we're we're not." We're not having kids assault a convoy. We're not using child soldiers. And, and Thunderbird just tells her, look, I, we're, we're, we don't have a lot of options, right? Like, it's this isn't my choice. This is what we're being driven to do. Um, uh, and, and, and Lauren is the one that kind of confronts her, and, and Andy's going to get involved in the conversation too, but but uh, Thunderbird holds him back and says, look, your, your sister, and, you know, he doesn't say this, but it's it, 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 it infers to me that it's kind of, Hey, Lauren's the oldest child. Let her work this out with your mother. Um, and uh, and and Lauren kind of calls her on Caitlin's calls Caitlin on her hypocrisy, right? Um, and it basically says, "Look, you're the one who told us that sometimes, you know, sometimes there are there, there are things worth fighting for that um, that are commensurate with taking a risk, right? There are things that you potentially sacrifice, and you know they may turn out bad for you, but uh, but they're important to fight for." Um, Caitlin eventually relents uh, in in a in, in an ending of the scene that I, that I I believe you know portrayed catching the 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 other characters in the resistance off guard. It caught me off guard because I was thinking there's no way she's walking away from this, um, saying yes, that's fine. I, and I was sure that the kids were going to have to go out on their own. Um, so it's a very interesting character development moment for Caitlin because she's clearly hit the hit the realization that you know we're we're in this fight now. I'm not going to be able to protect these kids. And, and more importantly, in an effort to defend, be capable of defending themselves, they need to participate in these things and learn and grow. Um, and, and and there's a brief second when Lauren asks her or or, or tells her um, that you know she needs to let them do this, and and kind of the the internal struggle I felt like kind of played out across Amy Acker's face and and her and her brow um, for about five six seconds before she answers. At least that's what it felt like. Uh, and then she says, and then she just kind of says, okay. And I'm like, it's yeah. such a powerful scene to me um, to see that play out. So I don't know. What were your thoughts on the scene? Yeah, no, I thought it, it was just very powerful. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we're not kids anymore. We're, you know, we're adults, you know. And then they've had to grow up fast because of this incident. So Now, you had some things that you observed between Thunderbird and Blake um, in between these yeah. episodes, in between these scenes. Right. So, um uh, Blink approaches Thunderbird and she's like, did we ever like, you know, go outside and inside together? And I, I can't remember if she mentioned, did we ever kiss? And he said, no, that never happened. Um, and, you know, we don't know what happened. You know, we, we know that there was an incident before where there's two couples that were put together by Dreamer and something bad happened out of that. So my concern is, you know, I feel like Blink is going to be, um, a main character and that they're not going to just, all right, she's got to go away now because this thing's become too much. They're going to have to address this issue. And it just seems like it's, it's already starting to take effect, you know, where Blink's got this um, affection for Thunderbird, but Thunderbird and Dreamer, you know, have this fling together so, uh, or used to have this fling. So, um, you know, it's it's this risky situation that's going to go on. I honestly hope that they actually do end up hooking up, um, even though, and then they still, you know, deal with these false memories. Um, but I, I really wish that we kind of knew what Blink's history was. Um, we know that she was in prison. We know she's been able to get out of prison. Um, so it it would just be interesting to know you know, 
who did she did she have a boyfriend before this did her family kick her out on the streets you know um you know because she might she might have you know fallen in love with uh thunderbird she might run into her past friends and be like i'm sorry but i i'm now in love with thunderbird you know so that could be an issue that comes up as well so that's just my thoughts on that yeah, even though I didn't have it in my list of scenes, I, I thought this was a wonderfully acted uh, scene as well. I, I I feel like it 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 seems I feel like the actress who plays Blink um, just Doesn't, yeah well just looks older than I think she is. But I think the character is really supposed to be kind of between like nineteen and twenty. Yeah, and I felt like this scene was wonderfully acted in terms of. Um, that's that awkward age where you're teetering between, you know, being a teenager and becoming an adult, um, and uh, and and I and, and so I feel like her her dialogue, which was this kind of mask veiled meaning of, you know, she doesn't come right out and say, "Hey, did we hook up?" or like, you know, <laughs> right? Did, did yeah. We, did we go outside and like, you know, and pound it out or whatever and come back? Like she she's like, "Did we go outside and then come back inside?" Like this very kind of awkward, illusory, uh, 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 you know, metaphor of, you know, two people going outside and, you know, having a heated moment and then, and then coming back in. So I, and, and I felt like that's, that's kind of the way, you know, some people act in, in that age, right? You, you don't make direct references, to, you know, in certain circles. Um, and it, it kind of portrays a little bit of her maintaining so, so, some innocence. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, so later in the, in the show, uh, we're getting, uh, this is about minute 28. So, um, so in another great bit of scripted dialogue and character building, Lauren admits to her. So at this point, um, uh, the, the Struckers, Caitlin and the two kids are on top of a building on a Sunday waiting, uh, for the convoy to come by to make their ambush. Um, and, and Lauren kind of kind of uh, has some lines that kind of admit her own teenage frailty, despite having appeared so strong in the previous scene that she was in, um, because they're talking and and Andy says, "Hey, it's really quiet. You know, there's something's wrong." Oh, bless you. And um, and Lauren goes, "Well, it's 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 re not really unusual. It's, it's Sunday. There's not going to be a lot of people out." And then she and then something clicks, and she goes, oh, "It's Sunday. Like the 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 football teams like." you know, end of season social or season social or whatever would have been today. And I was supposed to make corn muffins. And even though it's a yeah. reference to corn muffins, I'm sure she's thinking I, I would have been there and I would have been with my friends and we would have been hanging out with the football team. And, and the whole point is that, you know, she, she makes this just as she argued so vehemently in the past scene, in the last scene that they, they, they need to onboard with mutant kind, like for reals. Right. And, and yeah. like, and, and quit monkeying around. Right. She, she's also, got she also continues to have strong attachments back to society and, and she and she remembers that hey it, we're, if it weren't for the fact that we were on the run um right now i would be leading a normal life uh, and 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 clearly feel some sorrow for it and what i really like about the scene is that um again they make space for caitlin right because caitlin comforts her and, and reminds her you know where they are and what they're doing um reaches out to her there's a lot of kind of unspoken things that pass back and forth between them uh and and what is clear is that even though caitlin doesn't have powers it's clear that there is a role for her to play even as her children are becoming uh, more and more focused on on becoming active members of the mutant resistance so um it's going to be interesting as how it how it plays out again i i think they're kind of setting us up for Caitlin taking on a stronger leadership role. Um, it's also possible that we're being set up for Lauren to take a stronger leadership role within the mutant resistance. Um, say should something happen to Thunderbird and that Caitlin as the mom will become like the very strong advisor um, to Lauren. So it'll just kind of be interesting to see how that plays out. But I, I like that character dynamic. Um, yeah. And it also goes on top of last episode, right? Where she, her boyfriend you know, took the picture with another girl in front of their, their trashed home. You know, how painful is that? So it, it's different with Andy, right? Because Andy kind of, he didn't have anything. He was being bullied. So it's kind of the reverse. Becoming mutant has benefited him where it's the reverse for Lauren, where she's lost that normal life, that social life. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So uh, next, a uh, big scene, and, and at least my final one of my rundown. So as the mutants realize that their powers are being... So, um, so part of the setup now is um, you mentioned the character Pulse, and as the uh, mutant resistance uh, really commences its large-scale attack on the convoy, their powers um, are clearly being inhibited. Uh, and and so as they start to realize that, uh, Eclipse has apparently brought a forty five caliber Colt. <laughs> I think it's a Colt um, pistol. Uh, so he, so he pulls it and he starts laying down suppressing fire because um, Trader, who is, uh, who's uh, an African American mutant, um, uh, who has the ability to kind of blur himself out um, and, and almost go invisible. It's not quite full on invisible. Um, as and he's trying to get close enough to the convoy to get some intel, and as he gets close, he gets within the field of this uh, it, of Pulse's inhibiting mutant inhibiting powers, and becomes visible. And they see him. Sentinel Services sees him and and shoots him. Uh, so he falls down behind a bunch of trash cans. Uh, uh, Eclipse and Dreamer can't get to him, so Eclipse pulls out his forty five, starts laying down suppressing fire, so that Dreamer can get to him. Um, at this point, the Struckers are, uh, and this is interesting when I wrote this note down, because um, it's, so so, uh, so one of the big game releases this weekend was uh, was uh, Wolfenstein 2 New Colossus, and part of their marketing campaign is No More Nazis, um, which definitely is catching everyone's attention uh, in the wake of recent social uh, and, and racial tensions in this country. Um, interesting that a game publisher, uh, Bethesda, would kind of stay, take a stand like that. Um, but concurrently, I, I realized when I wrote my show notes down that uh, when you abbreviate Sentinel Services, it's SS. <laughs> which, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> which, <laughs> so I don't know if that's intentional. If it is, very smartly done, Fox. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so at this point, the Struckers uh, are trying to get to their vehicle, and when they get there, they see an SS guard um, – uh, reporting their vehicle in um, as he tries to, as he's investigating it and, and seeing if it's part of the mutants plan. Um, the kids' powers are being inhibited, so they can't do anything to this guard. Uh, and, and Lauren says, you know, mom, my powers aren't working. Like, wh what are we going to do? And, and Kevin says, I don't know if she has a line, but basically it's this feeling, it's kind of this, and, and I got this. Um, and the next thing you know, you see her pop up behind the guard and stab him in the neck um, <laughs> with a uh, with a needle, which has clearly some type of quick acting sedative. One of the most awesome scenes, again, because this is the person who doesn't have powers, right? Um, yeah, she's resourceful, though, right? It's right, ex exactly. Which makes her dangerous. Uh, she, it, she, her character feels to me like um, like Carol's character in The Walking Dead. Exactly. Right? There's, There's such a Carol vibe in her. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and, and so to me, it's one of the best Caitlin scenes, uh, in the show so far, as far as an action scenes go. Um, and, and again, I, you know, what I, what I wrote down is more and more the real star of the show and leader of the mutant seems to be becoming Amy Acker. Um, so, uh, also while this is going on, uh, we see, uh, uh, Thunderbird being the one who really takes action while everyone's powers are down. Uh, again, Thunderbird's a former Marine, um. And, uh, and and you had some mention of his encounter uh, with Pulse. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a scene where he recognizes his Pulse and he knows what he's got to do. You know, he, he takes one blow, he's still not down. Um, and eventually he's just got to full on, you know, knock him out. Um, but he's kind of like, Pulse is kind of in a zombie state. He's not reacting. He kind of looks weird, too. Um kind of like purplish I, I saw on his skin and he's got a weird tattoo on his arm um so it makes me wonder you know what are they doing with these mutants you know at the detention facility um how are they mind controlling them you know um, well, well that's my question so do you feel he's being mind controlled do you feel he's being drugged um i i consider briefly <laughs> what's that <laughs> Either or. <laughs> right, right. I considered briefly, does this mean that there is a a more powerful uh, telepathic mutant who is working for uh, the Sentinel Services? There, there could be. We don't know at all. Um, yeah. Pretty open-ended. I think, yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Um, but I mean, that was pretty cool. And then at the very last scene, um, Agent Turner, you know, he kind of proclaims this, you know, get rid of them all, you know, shoot them, kill them, um, get rid of all the sympathizers. So, you know, shit's going to hit the, start hitting the fan, um, pretty soon, um, with Sentinel services against the mutant resistance. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm kind of curious how much Turner is, how much longer Turner is going to last, uh, yeah, one of the things that's accurately accurately portrayed um, in the show, I feel like, from my own experiences, you know, when you're when when you're a government agent, like like t- tenacity does not keep you in your job, right? When you you know when when you go on a religious crusade and try and take people down, like your bosses aren't inspired by that because you want to keep trying, right? If you keep going after them and screwing it up, eventually they pull the plug on you. So. And, and he is having some significant failures. Uh, you, you know, he first got got you know failed to get Reed to uh, to admit to anything. Um, then failed to get him to turn the mutants in uh, last episode when he leapt from the van. And and now and now dude has escaped. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know he's you know he's you know in real world federal terms he is he is like. Man, he's like a paperwork day away from like you know being being pulled off this assignment. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, fills out. Yeah, and if you ever you know like sometimes villains will turn good. You never know, too. True, I don't expect that I'm to not, happen. Yeah, I don't think so with this guy. <laughs> um, and then it's interesting. I, I know you're not the preview guy, but the preview kind of seems we're going to get a sneak peek of that incident that started this. Oh, all. nice, very cool. Yeah, so I'd be very interested. I'm sure it won't be like. X Men's battling versus you know Magneto seeds, the kind right. of where our characters were during that whole incident. Right, and I know I have seen uh, cast credits for uh, actors and actresses portraying uh, his wife and his daughter. So, yeah. so yeah, I figured there was there would be some big flashback scene at some point in the season. So, so yeah, it'll be it'll be nice to see that and see that background piece filled out. Yeah, and hopefully we'll hear some more shout outs to like Magneto or Wolverine. You right. know. Right. That would be really cool. Um, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so that's about all I have it. You know, we kind of went through the whole sequence. Um, I guess we could talk about maybe predictions. Um, anything else uh, you want to throw out there? Um, I don't know. Feelings about the next X Men movie? <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting to see. Well, I'm going to stick with this show because it's going to be interesting to see where it goes, right? I just don't, I don't know that Polaris. I don't, I don't know that Polaris is going to actually have this kid. Um, yeah, it, I, I've kind of doubted that too. Yeah, because she doesn't have one in the comics, but maybe that's kind of what tips her overboard, you know, and goes on to you know join uh, Magneto and Genosha, if that's even you know, happening in this universe. Right. I, de- I definitely feel like one of the protagonists that we see is going to wind up becoming a villain, whether it's Polaris uh, or I, I have strong feelings that Andy is. He's definitely kind of taking a Machiavellian point of view. He's like, look, we we have these powers. Why are we monkeying around? Like, you know, get, you know, letting these humans get the better half of us. Um, you know, why can't we rob a bank? Well, because it's wrong. Well, no, it's only it would only be wrong if we couldn't do it, but we can, so we <laughs> shouldn't be wrong. Um, I, I love kind of this, this bit of philosophy and 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 human ethical perspective uh, that's being uh, debated uh, it, via the show. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm expecting one of them is going to go bad. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I, I worry that Reed is being set up to sacrifice himself uh, to to be off the show, um, and, I, and and I'm just I'm hoping. Uh, against all hope that we see some people from the X-Men franchise show up on the show. You know, I don't need Patrick Stewart, um, you know, but, uh, but like I said, I, I, I think my personal big hope would be that, uh, that we see Anna Paquin show up again, because she and Steven Moyer have that connection from being the leads on, uh, on true blood. Um, and I would, I would love this. And again, I, uh, you know, the thing, one of the things I despise Brian Singer for is for, Never having completed the story of Rogue, which he said he was going to do, um, but I would I would accept him completing it here. So it'd be cool if she showed up, um, and, and completing her story would be it would be enough for me to see her show up in something akin to the Rogue costume and clearly having that Rogue's 
power set, right? The invulnerability, yeah. the flight, uh, and the strength. Um, Any and, sort of movie tie-in. Like, I know that right, right, right. he's originally talked about that he's not wanting to go that direction. But I just felt watching the CW universe and that lack of any connectivity just kind of hurts. Um, and it's weird, right? Because now that they're, they've totally, I feel like, made the CW has made that it's never going to happen. And if anything, I feel like Titans is not going to even relate to like the DC movies. It's kind of my guess, because you know they've already they just established there's a a Bruce Wayne in the CW universe, and I, there, oh, I feel okay. like yeah, and I feel like you know it's we have three screen Bruce Waynes, right? You have the movie one, you have the Gotham yeah. one, and now the possible CW one. Like, I mean. That would be really weird if the gifted had like its own like you know versions of like Magneto or whatever. I just feel like, come on now, like how hard would it be to have just a blimp? Right, right. So um, I was going to ask you something about that, and now I've lost it and forgotten. Um, ah, yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, lost it <laughs> but yeah hopefully um you know like like you said but it 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 makes it makes my nerd uh sense tingle just a little bit like you said just to hear those nods right and and have those one-liners um that that allude to the presence of uh of those characters in that larger universe um that's pretty cool too so uh, if anything, I think you're right. I think Rogue or some other off X Men character would be good, and then have Magneto because you have Polaris, or at right. least Mystique, like one of Magneto's assistants, where there's a direct connection. Hey, this is what your dad wants you to do. That would be like really awesome to see that. Right. Like or, or, or Deadpool, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is definitely down for like he doesn't I, I I don't feel like he cares at all about like movie universe TV universe right I yeah. you know um or even like I said just an allusion to to Deadpool uh, I think would be cool so yeah 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 so we will see how it goes I I guess one of the big things progression pieces that I want to see is I, I do want to see Lauren and Andy take on whatever their mutant code names are going to be I'm very curious to see um, that's true that would be yeah that would be really neat. Yeah, because I, um, I just I just don't know. I mean, I have ideas for what their code names could be. I mean, you know, uh, Andy could definitely be Avalanche. Yeah. You yeah. Know, from, the, from the I mean, they they could they could they could spin that character differently, right? Since his power set seems to be um, kind of in a similar vein, uh, but not not perfectly so. But yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Um... I forget. Oh, and the fact that it would be neat if we had another psychic, you know, if that truly is what Andy's abilities is, that if you if you met another psychic that kind of guided him. Um, I don't right. know if he yeah. if he truly is a psychic though, because we haven't seen any of the mind reading, um, a part of his ability. Right. I mean, it's it's like I said, it's it's hard to tell if his abilities are somehow seismically oriented or if he's just a very incredibly powerful, but not yet focused telekinetic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it'll be it'll be definitely interesting to see that. So I don't have anything else, man. Uh, if uh, if it's okay with you, we'll just go ahead and get out of here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining in for this episode of Correction X, um, a show that has been so titled uh, because of uh, at least my feeling that this show is kind of writing the past wrongs of some of the installments of the X-Men franchise. Um, so I am pro X-Men right now after having gotten off that bandwagon um, quite a few times before. Uh, my co-host who has been here with me is Mr. Dave Petchy, part of the entertainment crew from the E2KG. And the E2KG crew um, is a network affiliate of the GWW radio network. So we are our own kind of satellite podcast team who has partnered with the GWW as one of its uh, subsidiary um uh, teams and uh, and we utilize their resources such as their uh, live stream capability on their YouTube channel um, to record our shows so thanks so much for joining in that's going to do it for us we will be back next week to talk about uh, season 1 episode 5 
Once again, this has been a guest, Lee Stamus and Dave Petchy from the E2KG Network. That's going to do it for us. We are out of here. We are all searching for that one moment when the music captures our soul. We live for the music. We die for our music. And that's what makes us who we are. We are all searching for that one moment when the music captures our soul. We live for the music. We die for our music.